Hello, I'm Dr. Hassan al Jahi, a physics professor at the University of Jordan in Amman, Jordan. The topic today is an interesting one. Physics, that is classic physics, specifically static equilibrium. This requires from us, my dear students, my beloved students, focus, reflection, and active participation. In the beginning, we have this static piece of wood on the table. It will remain static unless it is influenced by outside forces that can change its position, recalling Newton's first law of motion. External force may be movement by hand so that I push the piece to the front and it will begin to move with the application of external force that overcomes the static friction between the piece of wood and the surface of the table. To recall again Newton's first law. When the piece of wood begins to move, it will start to accelerate, and here begins Newton's second law, which gives us a value for the acceleration that has a direct relationship with the amount of momentum applied to the body. Now, if we apply another force equal to the first, we will have both forces applied to the piece of wood. And the question now becomes, will this piece of wood begin to move again with acceleration possibly higher than the first time? The answer requires some reflection. The reason is that the force has a direction and now we care about the direction of that force. Is the second force applied in the same direction as the first one? The answer, of course, is that the piece of wood will start accelerating and possibly with greater acceleration than the first time when one force is applied. If the second force is opposite in direction to the first one, that is to say, if we apply the first force in this direction and the second force in the other direction, we will just get two forces, equal in amount and opposite in direction. Also, look at the line of force. If the line of force meets, in the sense that two forces cancel each other, this body will become static, which is now known as dynamic equilibrium. The body will not move from its position because the amount of force is equal to zero. And the net force on the body that is, on the piece of wood, is equal to zero. There is a third possibility. The force applied in the opposite direction, that's the direction of the force. It means that two forces are parallel, but their line of force does not meet. Each has one line of force. In this case, pushing the piece of wood will cause it to spin around its major axis, which may extend through the center. In this case, if the piece of wood is to spin under the influence of two forces, equal in amount and opposite in direction, the rotational equilibrium is eliminated in the body. In this meeting, we are interested in dynamic equilibrium, whose net equilibrium is equal to zero, and whose rotational equilibrium does not enable the bodies to spin around their axis. That's to say, they remain static. These two points form the definition of static equilibrium. That is, static equilibrium has a dynamic equilibrium in one hand, as well as a rotational equilibrium in another. The dynamic equilibrium has three types. The first type is stable dynamic equilibrium. The second one is unstable dynamic equilibrium. And the third is neutral dynamic equilibrium. Now I will leave you with the first three minute break during which I want you, my beloved students, to define each type of dynamic equilibrium. You may propose an experiment so that we can illustrate the concept of dynamic equilibrium. See you in a few minutes. Goodbye.
Welcome again, my dear students. We will now discuss what is called dynamic equilibrium with its three types. I think you have had enough time to consult among yourselves and bring about some definitions. I will do an experiment to make the definition of equilibrium with its three forms easy for you. It's a very simple experiment. Let's consider this model that we have. It looks like a roller coaster. Imagine yourself at a fair being in one of the cars. You enjoy this ride. The path looks like the track and the red bead that moves easily is the car that you enjoy riding. The system in which this car moves depends on momentum. There is also a braking system. Now assume that the momentum has stopped and the braking system has broken down at any time. Now the question is, where would you imagine yourself? Or, in other words, where would you like to be so that you can stop the car without risk? Of course, if you look at the path in front of me, which looks like the track on which the car moves, there are areas I would not prefer to be in, namely in this inclination. Imagine that the momentum has stopped and there has been no braking system in front of you, what would happen to the car? It would fall in the other direction. So, I wouldn't like to be in, in any inclined zone, at least, and more specifically, in the last zone. I wouldn't prefer to be in this zone because the car would, of course, fall down. The question is, what zones would you prefer to be in? You may answer that they are the zones of equilibrium. But which zones of equilibrium? The zone is one of the zones of equilibrium, namely the upper zone. This particular zone is the most dangerous zone. It is called the zone with unstable equilibrium. For what reason? Because any simple force, even if it is the force of the air, would push the car forward and cause it to fall down. Hence, you lose equilibrium. It is very difficult to return to the same point. Thus, this high point as well as the second one are known to us as the unstable equilibrium points. There is another type of equilibrium. It's the one present in this zone or in the second low point. This type of equilibrium is called stable equilibrium. For what reason? Because any amount of force that is pushed forward should return to its stable position, or that is pushed backward by any simple force should return back as well. So, this is a position of a stable equilibrium or stability that I would prefer to be in. There is a neutral zone. It is almost straight. The simple reason why it is neutral is that any simple push or any force to the right or to the back would cause the car to move from one zone of equilibrium to another neighboring one. Therefore, zones of the neutral equilibrium under the influence of any simple force move from one zone of equilibrium to another. The zone of stable equilibrium, if moved from its position, will return back under the influence of a simple force of motion. In the zone of unstable equilibrium, if moved by, a simple push forward or backward would fall down to the direction towards which the force has been applied to and consequently lose the equilibrium. Those were the three types of dynamic equilibrium. Now, what about rotational equilibrium? Rotational equilibrium means that if the object is held in front of me, then where will I put the axis of rotation so that it will remain stable? Due to being homogeneous, I have been able to put my hand exactly in the center of such a piece. 
homogeneous means that the material is distributed regularly throughout. So I have been able to put my hand exactly in the center to get to the point of rotational equilibrium of the axis. I will bring about a non-homogeneous piece and put it in front of you. This piece is non-homogeneous and almost rectangular, but its edges have been cut out in different forms and some weights are added to emphasize its non-homogeneity. In its irregular distribution of the material through this piece in front of me. The question is, where is the center of gravity? If I look for the center just like a minute ago and put my hand in it, the piece will almost fall down. Now, I will leave you for five minutes. I want you to create a simple experiment to determine the center of gravity for non-homogeneous objects. See you shortly. Welcome again. During the past five minutes, I expect you have obtained an idea for doing an experiment to determine the center of gravity, and in particular, for non-homogeneous objects. As mentioned, the distribution of material in the homogeneous objects is regular. So, we expect the center of gravity to be exactly in the center of this material. That's unlike the piece whose edges have been cut out to the change the center of gravity, pass it from place to another one through putting some weights, 100 grams, 50 grams, 20 grams, and 10 grams in the other direction so as for changing the center of gravity of this body. Now, to determine the center of gravity, there is a simple practical way stating that we hang this body freely from several points as a pendulum. Yet, what is a pendulum? It is a cord with a heavy weight hanging from its end. We want to determine the center of gravity of this object while the other end is fixed. We will test this now. I will hang this piece which is similar to the one in front of me. When it, it's completely stable along the cord, we will draw a line on the piece to determine its center of gravity. Of course, to make the process so easy, I'm going to draw a line on the board to help me determine the center of gravity. Just like this, using the ruler. Now, I will hang this piece from a particular point, like a pendulum. When I fix this piece in this way, I will draw a line aligned with the extension of the cord that the weight is hung to. This point may be comparable to the original point. Now, I will draw a line extending from the hanging point to the point that I have specified in this picture. This is the first line I have drawn. Now, I will hang the second piece, but from another position, namely another angle, maybe from another point. When it becomes stable, I draw a line along the cord again. In the other direction, I add a mark to facilitate the process of drawing the line.
I draw the line again, noting that the two lines have intersected. In this way, the question is, what does the point of intersection represent? The point of intersection is the center of gravity of the body we have here. That is, the body whose edges are cut differently in this way. There are some weights upon it in order to change its center of gravity. We have found out as, as if the center of gravity moved to this zone. If I have used a ruler and wanted to determine the exact center of this piece, I would find it might almost be in this zone or within this one. This is the center of the piece. Note where the center of gravity has moved. It means that if I try to balance the piece from the center of gravity in this way, I will find it becomes stable since I put my finger on the axis of rotation or the fulcrum at the center of gravity. What does the center of gravity mean? It means if this whole piece is removed and a heavy weight equivalent to the weight of this piece is inserted, I can put it in the center of gravity. Now I'm going to state a simple equation for the homogeneous objects to determine their center of gravity. I will write this equation on the board. I will now draw the homogeneous piece, just like the one we have on the table, and assume that the distribution of material is regular. So it's expected that if its length is equal, as assumed, to 10 meters. the fulcrum will be in its exact center at a distance of five meters away from the first end as well as the second one. Now, this piece is in a state of rotational equilibrium. It's not allowed to spin clockwise spin down in this direction, or spin in the counterclockwise direction. Now, if a weight is put on that end and put another one of another on the other end, we get an equation in this form to ensure that equilibrium. The first weight multiplied by the distance of the weight from the axis of rotation the fulcrum or the center of gravity is equivalent to the second weight multiplied by the distance of the second weight from the axis or the axis of rotation. The equation is as follows. The first weight multiplied by the first distance that is, this distance is equivalent to the second weight multiplied by the second distance, and this is the second distance. If this is equal, we get equilibrium. Now the question is, if the first weight is not equivalent to the second, what would happen? Of course, the first distance would not be equal to the second, which means that the center of gravity would move closer to the larger weight. 
If the weight of the first object were greater in weight than the second, the fulcrum would move closer on this body, and this is what has happened in the experiment we have done by now. Now, my dear students, I would come out for five minutes and ask you to do a similar experiment but this time bring about a non-homogeneous piece of wood. We can use this law to determine the center of gravity. Bring about a non-homogeneous piece of wood in three weights, distributed as seen in this figure, and I want you to determine that practically. Move the center of gravity to the right, and to the left to the center of gravity, and I will be back after five minutes, God willing. Welcome again, my dear students. In this part of the meeting, we will do a very fun experiment summarizing all that we have done in the previous sections. The experiment requires a cup on the table, a spoon, and a fork. We will place them together to achieve equilibrium. We try to balance the three parts, the spoon and the fork, as well as the match so that we may achieve equilibrium, which is dependent on the center of gravity of the three pieces mentioned. Now, consider the system on the table. We will find out that the fork and the spoon, as well as the match, are stable. Consider this exact equilibrium. We need to reflect and ponder a bit so that we can illustrate this situation. Now, this is an exact equilibrium. You notice it is possible to move the piece completely from its position as long as I have not influenced the center of gravity, which remains in its position at the intersection of the match with the cup. Look, I have moved it from its position, but I have not moved the center of gravity. In for this reason, the system remains stable in its location. The explanation for this situation is the presence of static equilibrium, with which we started the meeting today. It is briefed in two parts, the dynamic equilibrium namely the outcome of the force acting on the system is equal to zero. There is a force pushing up on the match. It is an upwards driving force. There is another force equivalent to the weight of the match, spoon, and fork, which goes towards the Earth's center of gravity. Therefore, I get two forces, equal in amount and opposite in direction. Their total amount becomes zero. This indicates that there is a dynamic equilibrium. Hence, the system will not move from its position. The same case happens with the fulcrum in center of gravity. It is clear between the match and the neck of the cup in front of us, that is, the axis of rotation at that point. There is rotational equilibrium, namely, the group will not spin to affect its equilibrium and fall. 
I would like you to consider this exact system that we make now through this simple experiment and reflect on the existing structures around us, whether caused by nature or man-made. I'll leave you for five minutes in order to reflect on this. I want you to come out with examples showing static equilibrium and then discuss these examples with your colleagues. I will come back to you shortly to discuss this subject. Hello again, my dear students. In this part, God willing, we will give examples from nature, the work of nature, as well as man-made. I mean clues to indicate direct applications of static equilibrium. Now I have a picture of Petra, a Jordanian town built by the Nabatean Arabs about 2,000 years ago. This pink city is wonderful and has been selected to be one of the seven wonders of the world recently. Look at this picture. It is carved by nature, namely by erosion, in a way that suggests that this magnificent landmark, this wonderful formation with its upper part, seems to be ready to fall. However, if we reflect on physics in the former lecture, we will find out, of course, there is a center of gravity which, if it comes directly above the base upon which this enormous formation rests, which has been cut out by erosion in nature, it should be at the top of the base. There is also another man-made example. It's the Leaning Tower of Pisa, built in Italy in the 15th century and finished in the 17th century. This cultural landmark was built upright, but due to soil sediment at its base, it inclined. It is 56 meters from the base, but if you threw a stone from the top of the tower and fell vertically towards the ground, you would find out that it moved away for a distance of four meters from the base. And the question is, why does this building not fall, although it is built upright? The reason is that there is a zone, that is, the base, which holds the center of gravity so that the tower does not collapse. If the center of gravity moved outside the base zone, in that sense, that it would be located in one of these points, the tower would collapse. That is what we are talking about as static equilibrium. Now, all living creatures are also subject to the equilibrium during their movement. 
If the center of gravity moves from its position, from the center of their movement, or from their footsteps, they collapse or fall to the right or to the left. They become unbalanced. We have come at this moment to the end of our meeting today. I hope you, my dear brothers, that you have benefited greatly from this lesson and thank you for your contribution, thinking, and reflection and for the time you spent with me. Goodbye. Hello, I'm Dr. Hassan Al-Jahri, a physics professor at the University of Jordan in Amman, Jordan. Greetings, my dear brothers and physics teachers. Welcome and thank you for your good and precious efforts and your valuable time supervising and guiding your students through this meeting dealing with the principle of static equilibrium. When I started preparing this scientific material for this meeting, the bulk of my attention was to focus on a user-friendly way to easily deliver information and concepts into the minds of our beloved students to reinforce it in their minds. I proceeded gradually to give information till I have arrived at the end of the meeting to give real examples for static equilibrium. Dear teacher, you are free to choose to make this meeting in a single session, no matter how long it may be, or to view it through two consecutive sessions in two different days. Now I ask you that you divide your students into small groups. Each group does experiments and writes reports just as I have asked them to do through the breaks, owing to the effective participation of the largest number of students in the implementation of the tests required from them during the various breaks. At the beginning of the meeting, and as a prelude, I have raised many questions. The Answers were like an introduction to the definition of the concept of static equilibrium with its two types, rotational and dynamic. After that, I have defined dynamic equilibrium with its three types. Thus, the prelude concludes with a question conveyed to the students to come to definitions of each type of dynamic equilibrium then starts a short break up to three minutes. During this break, my dear teacher, you may ask your students about structures they know, their names, their locations, when established, etc., and show static equilibrium that can be linked in today's lesson. After this short break, I will present to the students a simple, fun experiment that brings closer to their minds the concept of dynamic equilibrium. And then I will provide a simple presentation about rotational equilibrium to start the second break after that. The length of the second break may extend to five minutes. During this break, I will ask the students to prepare a model like the one offered so they will need a piece of wood, easy bending wire, and a bead so that they can prepare th for their experiment. After preparation, I ask you to oversee the work of a contest between students. Each student from each group is to push the bead slightly forward to see which one of them can move the bead to a position of the unstable equilibrium. In this way, it will be an entertaining competition for them. This is how we end the second break. When the second break ends up, 
I will come back to present a simple experiment to help to determine the center of gravity of a homogeneous body. The information here is to bring the understanding of the principle of rotational equilibrium for students, but during the third break, I want students to do the same experiment. I suggest that the non-homogeneous body, which they will use to determine the center of gravity, may be a piece of wood or a tree trunk upon which several different weights are put in different positions. During the fourth break, I will ask my dear students to determine the point of equilibrium for a system that consists of a spoon, a cup, and a match. And then, after determining the points of equilibrium, they participate into a competition requiring whoever is able to hold this system in the hand to come quickly towards the leader to a Jew, my dear teacher. It is a fun contest for the students. It's also possible to experience the power or status of equilibrium of various systems through hitting them to see what angle that the system goes through before collapsing. In the last part of this meeting, I give examples of man-made as well as of natural structures or structures that nature has helped to form through erosion and show static equilibrium to conclude our meeting today in physics. I wish you, my dear teacher, at the end of this meeting, that you give a brief summary for the students on the most important concepts that you presented during the meeting. Finally, thank you, my fellow teachers, for your attention, your help, and your patience with me until the end of this lesson. I was so happy to give this lesson. Goodbye.